A fertilizer is any material of natural or synthetic origin that is applied to the soil or to the plant tissues to supply nutrients. Modern fertilizer practices are relatively recent, and they only date back to just the last half of the 20th century. However, traditional fertilizer practices are much older. Although it was previously thought that fertilizer use had only dated back to 2,000 years ago, it is now believed that early farmers were using fertilization techniques as long as 8,000 years ago. A team led by Amy Bogard, an archaeobotanist at the University of Oxford, decided to look for evidence of earlier fertilization use. In ancient times, manure would have been the most logical fertilizer to use. And due to the fact that manure contains a higher than normal concentration of the rare nitrogen-15 isotope, the team decided to focus their efforts on searching for this chemical compound. The researchers collected ancient samples of cereals, such as wheat and barley, as well as peas and lentils, from 13 early farming sites across Europe that date from 2,000 years ago to over 8,000 years ago. They analyzed over 2,500 individual cereal grains and discovered that the nitrogen-15 levels were much higher than they would normally be. So the fact that these grains contain this rare isotope is excellent evidence to the fact that humans were using manure as fertilizer. Later, the Babylonians, Egyptians, Romans, and some Germanic tribes are all recorded as having used minerals or manure to increase yields on their crops. For thousands of years after agriculture came into existence, manure was the main source of fertilizer. But sometime in the 18th century, it became common knowledge that ground up bones provided crop nutrients. By 1815, England was importing so many bones from the rest of Europe that all the other countries on the continent started complaining that England was robbing them of a natural resource. In the USA, the customary source of bones was from livestock packing houses. Another gruesome source was the many thousands of tons of bison bones covering the western prairies, left behind from the mass slaughtering of the great American buffalo herds. Many of the early Nebraskan homesteaders were saved from bankruptcy by gathering these bones and selling them for processing into fertilizer. Speaking about lots of bones, did you know that 18,000 people died over bird poop? Yep. In 1804, the Prussian geographer Alexander von Humboldt was working in Peru when he noticed the booming trade of guano fertilizer. He quickly realized the value for farmers back home, who were desperately struggling to maintain soil fertility to feed their growing population. He brought home samples of the guano for testing, and top chemists of the day confirmed this was a major discovery. After the establishment of Peruvian independence, the guano export trade to Europe and the USA set off a frenzy of resource exploitation that continued for almost a hundred years. And in 1864, war broke out between Spain and Peru. Spain, demanding repayment of the debts arising from Peru's War of Independence, took control of the Shania Islands, which were the main source of guano for Peru and surrounding countries. They occupied the islands from 1864 to 1866. These islands were so crucial to the region that a small war that only included Spain and Peru came to include the countries of Chile, Bolivia, and Ecuador. The war raged for another five years, and after it was all over, up to 18,000 people had died. All because of guano. Pretty, pretty crazy. The essential nature of guano had long been understood by the natives of the region. Guano fertilized the farms that fed the complex Incan civilization. Those farms produced vast quantities of potatoes and quinoa. The Inca carefully monitored their guano reserves. Hunting the seabirds that turned the sardines into agricultural gold was a crime punishable by death. The guano was guarded by stewards. These, well, poop stewards ensured that each citizen got their equal share. The very power of their empire was drawn from its proximity to the guano islands. But this power would soon diminish. And so too would the use of guano fertilizer, when in the mid 1800s, a new science sprung from the rolling hills and windswept pastures of Eastern France. The science of agricultural chemistry, Around 1834, the French chemist J.B. Boussingault began a series of innovative experiments on his farm. He created a nutrient balance sheet, 
which compared the total nutrients applied to a crop with the total taken up by the crop. Another early innovator was a German chemist named Justus von Liebig. He patented an original artificial manure. However, this failed in practice because the manufacturing process made the phosphate unusable to plants. But these two threads of research were soon woven together. In 1843, agricultural chemist John Bennett Laws used Bussingald's methods on his estate near London. Well aware of Liebig's failures, he made his own phosphate manure using a process he had patented in 1842. This method involved treating naturally occurring mineral phosphates with sulfuric acid to make something called superphosphate. In this form, phosphate is rapidly released into the soil, where it can be used by plants. If you're thinking that the rendering process of this fertilizer sounds toxic, you'd be right! Although superphosphate is an effective fertilizer, it also has the ability to cause significant damage to the environment around it. If it's over-applied to the crop, or if the nutrients in this fertilizer are not fully utilized by the growing plants, the excess nitrogen and phosphorus can be washed away from the farm during a rain event. This runoff eventually ends up in the surrounding creeks and rivers. When this happens, it supercharges the growth of algae and causes the nitrate levels in the water to spike. Anyone that's ever owned an aquarium will tell you, this is bad news. The amount of oxygen in the environment can drop significantly, which kills off the majority of the aquatic life. This process is called eutrophication. The next significant innovation in chemical fertilizer was something called the Haber process. Developed by Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch, it uses extremely high pressure to force a chemical reaction. The byproduct of this process is ammonia, which is then used to create fertilizers. Although the fertilizers created by this method are extremely effective in the short term, in the long term, they carry the same risks as other chemical fertilizers. Well guys, that was, um, that was thoroughly depressing. But <laughs> did you know there's another type of fertilizer that's existed before the Haber process, before bone meal fertilizer, before superphosphate, even before human civilization, this type of fertilizer was being made. And it's being made under your feet as I speak. It's worm poop. Here's my dad to talk about it. So here we have worm bits. We've got a worm wigwam. Uh, we've got a worm bin from Michigan Soil Works. And we've got a worm bin from Common Composting. They're all a little bit different. They're all being used for a little bit different things. Uh, this one is being used to propagate the other two. So this is our kind of like our, our nursery for worms. Uh, this one is a mechanical uh, worm bin, uh, which actually allows us to put uh, three additional uh, worm bins on this one and have one motor harvest all three of them. So it's kind of a commercial worm bin. We're really excited about it. We're getting ready to get our second uh, bin attached to it. Uh, about 32 square feet, surface feet on this one and that of the common compost bin down there, which is a manual system which would be really good for community gardens and stuff in the middle of the of the city or, or the the neighborhood if you want to do your worm bins that's a piece of cake uh, that uses uh, manpower uh, uses a, a ratchet to drive a blade through it to harvest your your vermicast and these are they're they're flow through bins so you've got all the food I'm going in on top. So I get my food on, on top, and the worms that we have in here are actually, they're, they're European red wigglers. Insignia fetida is a Latin name, and they're not really earthworms. They're kind of, they're um, organic matter worms, and they like to feed at the top. They poop. When they poop, that poop gets driven down, so it flows down. Uh, when we're feeding them, they come up to the top. When we harvest, we harvest from the bottom. So as this blade comes through the bottom here, there's a grid uh, at the very bottom of this, and the, the vermicast drops through this grid. It's kind of like really wide chicken wire. And then we harvest out of there, and we take it to our blueberries. The reason that we're doing this is twofold. Uh, number one, we want to replace 
our synthetic fertilizer with the vermicast, which is an organic or a biological fertilizer, and we think that we can reduce synthetic fertilizers by 50%, maybe more, by just giving our plants the, the vermicast in all of its various forms. We wanna do this because we wanna be able to take green waste back out to the farm and have it go back into the food cycle. And we wanna increase the health of the soil. These little guys, these worms that we've got in here are magic. If you've ever heard the term black gold, that's worm poop. And worm poop is the best soil on earth. When we walk around on the, the ranch, as you're work, walking on the, the roads and the, and, the, and the really good topsoil, you're walking on that worm poop. Uh, it's, it's remarkable stuff. And if we can drag in from the grocery stores and from people's kitchens, green waste and feed it to the worms and have the worms do their thing and give us this vermicast, which we then take out and put back onto the, the crops, we've actually created a really nice food cycle and taking care of a food waste diversion problem at the same time. So part of the idea here is to train other farmers and ranchers how to be animal husbandry experts, because they are animals, they're worms, along with their other jobs being farmers or ranchers. We can put this out on the cropland uh, for a lot less uh, money than what it would cost for uh, certified uh, composting. And we can put this into a liquid form. If you want to walk over here, I'll show you this. This here is a brewer. This one's from GOT. We, we have a couple of them. This is a Ford Vortex brewer because you create a circular vortex of water flow. We put the vermicast in a bag in the top. We then add whatever kind of worm microbe community food that we want to it uh, to, to either increase the bacterial community or increase the fungal community of this now worm extract. It's now in liquid form. We can now take this and put it straight into our drip system and have a liquid form of this, this really high value organic material go in under uh, the blueberry berms and really create a, a, a nice situation for the organic communities that live under the blueberry fields. To a certain extent, agriculture has gotten a bad rap over the last few years because of the pollution from the nitrate runoff and some of the other things that happens when you really drive a lot of synthetic fertilizers into the, into the ground. One of the things that our worms do for us is it gives us an opportunity to exchange that synthetic fertilizer with the organic fertilizer, the, the, the real natural stuff. Um, but you can't overuse vermicast. You could put 5 million tons of it on an acre and it would do nothing but good for that acre. There is no such thing as vermicast pollution. When you put the vermicast in the ground, you are actually allowing your plants to create a, a better network to transfer nutrients back and forth between the soil and the plants and, the, and everything that goes along with that uh, in a way that synthetics just can't do. And actually a lot of organic fertilizer can't do. It's not just about the fertilizer and giving the plant what it needs. It's about the soil community and the soil community wants that vermicast extract or solids go into the ground near your crops becomes healthier. It's good for the community.